<laughs> Y'all know what it is. <laughs> Bang ding ding, trademark. Ah, he come out. Six foot seven tall. Bang ding ding, one is star. <laughs> Hey everybody and welcome back to the show. In this episode of Eggs the Podcast, we're pleased to introduce you to Alejandro Sita. Alejandro is a California and Florida mortgage broker and the president of Prosperity Lending, a firm that specializes in servicing self-employed borrowers such as artists and small business owners. A real estate and mortgage professional since 2005, Alejandro has seen the world of real estate from all sides, commercial, residential, and capital raising. Not only does he have a significant background in real estate and finance, but also as an entrepreneur, he created a million dollar retail enterprise through the Home Shopping Network. A lifelong student of economics, Alejandro provides his clients with practical financial advice on a routine basis. And in fact, in his upcoming book, Money, What It Is, How It Works, and How You Can Use It to Create Wealth and Prosperity for Yourself and Your Community, Alejandro teaches the fundamentals of wealth building and answers the questions such as, what is money and what is value? Joining us today for a conversation about whether or not it's a good idea to own property right now, what you can do to survive and thrive under any economic conditions, the difference between investment and speculation, and a whole lot more. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Alejandro Sita. Hey, Alejandro, how are you? Hi, hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Of course. Yeah, no, we're thrilled to death to have you. This is a, an exciting topic, and, uh, you know, we... Both Mike and I have a, an interest in real estate, and uh, and Mike actually worked in the industry for some time, so he, so we both have an interest. But uh, we honestly don't get that many real estate guys, so this is awesome. I'm really uh, looking forward to having this conversation with you. Thank you. So cool. I guess let's just kind of get started. Maybe at the beginning, let's talk a little bit about, about sort of where you come from, uh, what you're doing uh, presently, and uh, let's just sort of talk a, a little bit about that timeline. Yeah, I I was born in the country of Chile. Um, I lived in Chile uh, in, into my early 20s. And then after that, I started to travel abroad and I lived in different countries. Eventually, in the 90s, I settled in the U.S., in, in Los Angeles, Los, Los Angeles in, in, in Southern California. And I have been in Southern California ever since. I travel a lot, you know, uh, before the lockdowns. I used to go to other countries too. Now, thanks to Zoom, you know, I'm having this interview and I'm seeing most of my customers over Zoom. A year ago, I didn't know, even know what Zoom was until a customer said, let's do Zoom. And I go, what is that? Um, I've always been in business uh, for myself um, most of my life. And I have been attracted to the subject of money simply because every single question that I've asked about money since the age of six or seven, I remember that I never received a clear answer. And it seemed to me that, that the money, money, work, you know, um, having a business, a, economics, it's been a subject that to me, since the very beginning, I could never found a, find anyone that could give me a, a coherent, uh, rational response. You know, like if you go to, to, to engineering and you study engineering and you study how to build a bridge, any university you go, you're going to find the same thing. The professor is going to tell you about the materials, about equations, and about physics. And when you build a bridge, it's, very, it's pretty obvious because if you didn't do a good job, cars are just going to fall through. If you did a good job, the bridge is going to stand. But I've never seen a field like economics or money or business where you could have so many opinions and some of them are completely the opposite of others and they coexist at the same time. So that's what intrigued me. And that's what really drove me in like a black hole, you know, into it. So I, ch I chose, just to answer your question, I chose the subject of lending because the same thing happened in lending. I thought, well, it's pretty obvious, you know, I want a loan. In the subject of lending, even though it's supposed to be a clear cut, dry, you know, boring, you know, follow the rule, do this, do that, you'll find the same black hole of um, conflicting information in that field. So that's why I got sucked into it. How long have you been doing lending? Uh, when did you start and uh, how did you get started in that field specifically? I got started in that field like uh, when I was a boy, when my brother came up to ask me for some money. And then <laughs> I thought, if I give him the money, I'm never going to see it back. 
So I borrowed from my grandmother an old typewriter and I type wrote a, a full contract, you know, okay, I'm going to give you this money, but you have to do this and this and this. And then I started to do this when I was a kid. I used to have all these big contracts. And then one day my mom found one of them, read it, and she goes, you cannot do that. You are, are you serious? You are like ripping off your brothers. You're ripping off your friends. You know, this is bad. This is immoral, blah, blah, blah. So after a while, it sort of killed it. And then um, I used to be in sales and I used to be in marketing. Well, I'm still in sales in marketing, but I, I was, you know, that, that, that uh, thing that you played on the intro that I sold at the Home Shopping Network, that was a product that I created with a business partner that we sold. So I, I was always in business. And then that's what I call my other life in the 90s. And then one of my clients, you know, one of my, I used to be in the infomercial business, you know, making these long television commercials, selling things. And then one of my good friend infomercial clients said, hey, why don't you come to a financial seminar? This is what's in, somewhere in the, at the late 90s. And then is when I made the switch. And then I became a financial guy. And then that pretty much very soon I went into lending after that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's a, an interesting transition from uh, from infomercials into finance. Sort yes. of a, a weird left turn, I guess. So, but, uh, but I guess I can see how there's sort of, I guess, some parallel traits, right? Some things that you have to be good at in one that, that support you in the other, you know, whether it's uh, an ability to deliver a message or tell a story or to be able to, you know, offer a sales pitch. Um, I think those characteristics are all sort of the same. So even though they feel very, you know, uh, apart or the two different uh, lines of work seem very apart, they're actually very close. Yeah. And I'll tell you what helped me and why I decided to do the mortgage business, because in most professions you have to sell. However, in mortgages, I don't sell. What I've noticed in mortgages, people don't explain. You go to a mortgage broker, you go to a lender, they, they fill your head full of acronyms and nobody explains what it is. All I do, believe it or not, I don't sell anything. All I do is I take the loan program and I explain it to the customer. And then he goes, well, what if we do this? What if we do that? And I spend the time and I explained it. So it's, it's, I'm lucky that nobody does it. And that's why I was able to build a business with it. So you, you tend to focus on artist types and self-employed and people that have um, alternate sources of income, not a nine to five per se. Um, can you maybe break down why, why you went that route and why that's your focus? And then also um, maybe uh, talk about the importance, like why working with a, an artist or a self-employed person is different and getting loans than someone who is a, uh, a regular nine to five person, nine to five job. Yeah. Yes. And I'll just add too, before you get started, Alejandro, that this is my situation. And I wish I knew you before I bought our house, because uh, I will tell you as a self-employed person, uh, scraping together the, the documentation and then just like the extra money I had to come up with and all that stuff to do this as a self-employed person was really a challenge. So uh, I'm excited to hear about this. Thank you. It's emotionally dra draining. So let me ask, let me answer the first uh, part of your question, Mike. I became this because I suffered this myself. I remember in the 90s, um, I, I, I was a foreign guy, you know. I just wanted to buy a van. You know, I was in the business of selling, so I just wanted to buy a van. And I had the money to buy it. And a friend said to me, hey, don't, don't, don't use cash. Get a credit because you need credit. I didn't know what credit was, you know, where I came from. Credit did not exist. What it exists was, was a blacklist. So if you didn't pay or if you defaulted, you will be in this blacklist. So whenever you went to the bank or you went to get a loan, they would check that you were not on the blacklist. That was a good sign. And that's it. That was not the actual, the actual positive side of it that now you did pay, you did, um, you did comply with the terms of your loan. That side was not present. So that came to me as a surprise that it was better to have a credit record than to have the cash. So I experienced time after time, not just with the van, but pretty much everything I've done since my first credit card to this, to that. I experienced such a, a it was so problematic See, for me, for seemingly stupid reasons, you know, or reasons, let me not use that word because then they're going to ban me from if you ever put this on. <laughs> For reasons that to me did not make any sense or for reasons that to me were completely immaterial. And that perplexed me, you know, so that again, like a black hole, it tended to suck me in. You know, I, I am very curious. So these things that don't make sense suck me in. 
And then I, dis- I saw, you know, when I entered into the field of real estate, I thought, I saw that it was a really exciting field. You know, I'm a mortgage broker, but I'm also a real estate broker. I also worked as a realtor. I also worked in, in, in commercial real estate. I was mentor. I was very lucky to be mentored by, in my opinion, one of the best brokers in West Side Los Angeles. When I met him, he already had like, he's been in, he had been in business for like 30 to 40 years. So I got, I was very privileged to have, to be mentored by him. So I've, I've been around the real estate business in all these aspects from the listing side, from the buyer side, from raising capital for real estate projects, syndication, you know, and lending, but I happen to like lending the most. But to answer your question, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those self-employed people, entrepreneur people that find it very difficult to get a loan. So that's why. Then to answer the second part of your question is that lenders, if, if we were in 1970 or if we were in pre-1990, it would have been very easy. We would have gone to the bank. We would have talked to a person that already knows us, which we might have opened the account with him or her. He would know, this is what I experienced in Chile. So that to me, that was not ever a problem over there. I had an account executive that knew me, knew me for already many, many years. He knew my bank balance. He knew how much I did for a living. He, he could just with a couple of uh, keystrokes see my recent account activity. He knew my family. So whenever I needed money, I just made an appointment, went to talk to him and say, hey, I need this money for this and that. He would say, when can you pay it back? This is what we can do. You like it? Yes, you like it. Sign here. Done. The money is in your account. That service used to also exist in the United States, but it was completely dropped. It was abandoned. Banks realized that they could save more money if they created automatic automatic processes where you didn't have to have a loan officer. Because if you have a loan officer or a bank executive, he can only see so many people per day. He can only have a relationship with so many people per day. So banks made the decision that they were only going to do that for the really affluent. And when I'm talking about affluent, I'm talking $10 million plus. I know a lot of uh, business owners that are wealthy. You know, they have a couple of million dollars here. Their business sell maybe $20 million a year. They make almost a million dollars a year income. But believe it or not, that is not enough to get the kind of service that everyone was getting in the 1970s or even the 1980s or even to some degree in the 1990s. Blenders found out that if they automated the process, they could serve 95 or 96% of the people automatically at a much reduced cost. And then they went for that. So everybody else, the other 6% just fell over, you know, by the wayside, but nobody cares because they make so much money with the other 94% that that's the way they decided to go. Also, part of the problem is that after World War II, is when the secondary market became very active with the creation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So those institutions started to like impose ever more regulations on the type of loans that they wanted to buy. And that goes against the entrepreneur or the, or the self-employed person, because we as entrepreneurs, <clears throat> not only we have an unusual way of making our living, also our cash flow is variable. You know, we get, peaks where we get a lot of cash and then we get throws when we don't get a lot of cash. And then that goes against the rules of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in order to be able to buy a mortgage. So right there, just by that factor alone, we are not there. Then also an entrepreneur and a business owner tries to reduce the, his or her bills in order to maximize his profit. A tax return is just a bill. So any business owner will make it his business to find out about how it works, you know, and to find out about how he can minimize his tax bill. An employee doesn't think that way. An employee thinks that uh, the tax form is a document. They don't spend too much money, you know, or much time finding about it. They believe that the accountant should know, and that's why they're paying them, and they're okay with that. So the tax return of an employee tends to reflect more accurately the type of money they can, not because the, not because the self-employed is a quote unquote a cheater or a bad guy, it's simply because the self-employed or the net worth or the high net worth individual spend time and money finding out what are the existing regulations that allow him to pay less and uses those regulations 
So yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I went into a too <laughs> big of a tangent, but that's no, the you, reason why I decided to become what I, I am, and this is the reason why I specialized, and this is why it's so hard for people to be able to find a loan if they don't belong to the ninety four percent. Yeah, uh, you covered a lot in that little bit. Um, Ryan and I have both been down similar paths trying to. Ryan bought a house. I haven't yet, but I'm in the process of saving for one right now. But um, in the past, when I would file my taxes, I would file my taxes with the thought of get the most write offs as I can, the most things I can, uh, mileage, everything I could think of, get the, the, the write offs. And um, in the last few years, I've kind of changed my mindset. I don't know if this is correct or not, but I, I want to show that I have more income so that I can qualify for a loan and show that the, the money's coming in instead of just writing it off, writing it off, writing it off, buy a new speaker here, do this, do that. So um, is that, I mean, it, back in the day, back pre 2008, you could go in and get a stated income loan and you could get, you know, anything just say, Hey, I make 400 grand a year. They take it and, and go with it. And then since the crash, things have changed. You can't really do that anymore. Uh, what what options are available for self-employed individuals now that aren't necessarily stated income loans uh, that that qualify for people like Ryan and I? You know, the stated income loan does exist, but really? it's very hard to find. It's called a, it's called it's called community community lending. There is a standard. It's not community lending, but it's something like that. You can get, some banks have this, some banks have a classification by the treasury department that they are community lenders and they are allowed to lend to the, what they call the un unbanked. Unbanked is the person that technically is not in the banking system, but that is a very inaccurate word because this is when you need to get a community lending loan. You only need to have a credit score of around 700 or more. And you need to have about 25 to 30 percent of the down payment if you have those two things and if you go to a community lending bank then you can get a loan which is pretty much stated but very few banks have this classification a new one in new york that had it and now i know another one in southern california that has it but pretty much this is a very obscure niche that very few people know about so you can do that in addition to that, you have about seven other ways, in addition to the tax return way, to get a loan. I'm just going to tell you a few of them. Sure. You can use bank statements. But when I say bank statements, this is the interesting thing. You can use business or personal or both. You can commingle them and you can use them to prove your income. You can use, uh, it, it happened to me, it happened to me last year. I had an artist actually that wanted to buy a condo. He had about twice the money in his checking account all ready to buy it. They like said, you know, Alejandro, I could buy cash. I don't want to do that. I don't want to spend half of my money doing that. Can you give me a loan? There is a loan program that if you are in his position, if you have about one, two times the price, let's say the, the thing costs 100, you have 200 in your bank. If you have two times the amount of what you're buying, we can use your bank balance to qualify you. That's another way. Another way, if you have income that is coming from assets, you know, you have you don't have to go to work every day, but it's not that you don't work. It's that your income, instead of coming from earned income from a job, comes from managing your assets. We can get your loan based on that, based only on your assets. Now, if you have if you have a company and the company is healthy and the company really makes money, but let's say it's not on the tax returns of the company, it doesn't even matter. We can get you a loan based on the profit and loss of the company. So we can use bank statements, either commingled, or not, we can use the profit and loss, we can use the assets that are generating an income for you, or we can use the existing cash that you have in your bank. Say that you come to me and say, Alejandro, I have no job because I haven't worked in a year or two or three or four. I have no job, I want to buy this million dollar place and I have $2 million in my bank account. Can we do it? As long as your credit score is not shot, the answer is yes, we can. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot more channels than were offered to me when I was going through. Yes. And there is something else. All of these things have flavors, have variants. So when I'm, I'm talking about bank statement, just the bank statement world alone has like seven or eight ways of combining them and different ways. The, 
the assets that I'm talking to you about has another three or four variants, you know, the having money in your checking account has another variant. So usually what ends up happening is that when we get somebody for a loan, I want them to tell me the whole story because it could be that there is a particular variant of a particular way that when you massage it, when I mean massage, it's like, and if I go to us to ashtray, just stop me. Okay. Or if I go too much on a tangent, but this is what is happening. Most of the advertising we see today, most of the ideas that we have about loans today, and most of the regulations that we have about loans today are based on, on the standard of the W2 employee loan. The standard of the W2 employee loan and how to make that loan so Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac can buy it on the secondary market has become the yardstick for which everything is compared to. Like when you read in the newspaper, oh, you know, 30 year rate is blah, or this is blah. They are only talking about that, that classification of loans. And believe it or not, that is a classification that although a lot of people use it, it's just a fringe type of doing a loan. It's, a, it's, it's like me saying, you know, we are going to classify all food and we're going to use as a yardstick how donuts taste. And you say, well, I'm never going to buy a donut. I don't even like donuts. It doesn't matter. Everything is going to be measured against the donut. This is the same thing. They're taking a specific type of very specialized type of loan that many people can use and they're using that as the yardstick. So now when I get you another loan that deviates from that, people automatically tend to compare one with the other, but they are not comparable. That is only a fringe way of doing a loan. So when I get you a bank statement loan and you go, well, but you know what? I can get a loan at 5%. Well, it's not that you can get a loan at 5%. There is a loan that complies with this specific rigid guideline advertised at 5%. It doesn't mean that you can get it. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, I think that that's super interesting. And I think that the, I, I mean, I, I wish I knew more about the terms of my loan. Unfortunately, it was so much like a, us just sort of, sort of thrashing to make it work, right? But uh, but I know that we had to, you know, produce business documents, personal documents. Um, they, they weren't looking at balances, but I, you know, I ended up having to pay a little extra down to get the interest rate we wanted and all that kind of stuff, you know, and thank goodness we bought it just before, you know, the the time period we're in now. But that sort of leads me to my next question. I wanted to talk to you. I mean, we've spent a lot of time covering mortgages, but I mean, is it even a good time to own property right now? You know, this is a very interesting question. And this is a question that I post myself over and over over the years. And I'm just going to tell you a little story. I remember back when I started doing these loans, back in 2005, back in 2006, I read an article on the paper. There was a couple uh, seeking to buy a $350,000 home. And I remember this since then. And they were basically asking, should we buy it? Because this home was a 320. You know, there was a time between 2005 and 2007, I don't know if you remember, where homes were like going exponentially higher and higher. Every month, every two, three months, the home would be 20,000, 30,000 more. So this couple was in that period, the beginning of that period in 2005, when the home that was 350, just a month ago was a 320. And homes were going like that. And they were afraid that they were going to overpay for something that was not really worth it. That home today is worth over $1.5 million. So is there a good time to get a mortgage or not? When I started doing mortgages, I remember my first mortgage, I got this girl a deal. That was the deal of a lifetime. That was seven and a half percent. So I always tell my customers, don't focus on the rate, focus on your goal. What is the goal that you want and what is the best way to achieve your goal? Because the rate could be immaterial and usually is. I'll tell you another story. A month ago, we closed on a loan, single family residence for business purposes, rate eight and a half percent. You go, wow, eight and a half percent. How come? Well, this lady is an entrepreneur. She runs homes for the elderly. She makes very good money to her. She could never buy this home before because there was no loan program that would uh, buy it. And she didn't want to pay hard money rates. Hard money rates is 12% or more. She wanted a fixed loan that she could count on and that it would allow her to achieve her goal. We found her a loan program, a fixed eight and a half percent fixed for 30 years, which she didn't have to worry about. Because of her business model, that is absolutely nothing to her. And it was the only way that she could buy the home. And she did it. 
and she's super happy. I always say, don't worry about the rate. There is always a way to massage the rate. Like you were saying right now, you know, there was a way that you could pay a little bit more and reduce it. And like that, there are many rules. And that's why I call it massaging. Because when you're going to get a loan, usually your mortgage broker says, this is your rate, but this is false. Usually anyone and everyone qualifies for 50 or more rates. Of the 50 rates or 60 sometimes, once in a customer class, he, he had like 150 rates he could choose for. Of those massive amount of rates, about five or six make any sense. So you get a range. Nobody tells you that. You qualify for a range of rates. Let's say you qualify from, I'm just making this up now, from four to 4.5. But the mortgage broker says it's 4.3. But it's not 4.3, it's between 4 and 4.5. And each one of them has slightly different documentation, slightly different costs. Wouldn't, we, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to know the range and to know what it would be to go down to 4 and what are the advantages on going to 4, 4.5? Because we're conditioned by the press and advertising to believe that 4 would be better. But you know what? 4.5 could be better. Why is that? Because at four and a half, the bank will kick in enough money to pay for all your closing costs. And if you go, you know, Alejandro, I just want to buy this house for three years. Then it will, it will be better if the bank pay for your closing costs. But if you say, Alejandro, this is my dream uh, house and I don't foresee moving in over 30 years. I would say, you know what? Pay the closing costs and get four. But this is just a small sample of the kind of conversations you can have in order to decide what portion of the range you're going to go for. So yeah, don't a, focus on the rate, focus on the goal. And then let's, there are like hundreds and hundreds of loan programs to address every shade of a goal. So this is what I say, focus on the goal, communicate the goal clearly, or my job as the mortgage broker is to get from you what your goal is. Sometimes we don't know. I help you get to the goal. And then once we have the goal, let's find the most efficient program, not necessarily the cheapest or the most expensive, the most efficient one that will get you to the goal faster. Yeah, no, it's fun. It's funny that you say that because I'm totally, uh, you know, victim of this, you know, idea that the best rate is the lowest rate, right? Or the the best deal is the lowest rate. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, and it's funny you mentioned sort of in the old days, I mean, the first house that we ever owned, uh, you know, it was only a $96,000 house. It was our starter house, but it was at 6.5%. And so now, you know, interest rates are somewhere around the, you know, the mid fives or whatever they're, they're at now. Uh, now. And, you know, I, I still look at that and go, oh, well, God, we were paying 6%. You know, it's like, you know that's still not a bad deal for me. Um, of course, you know, we have a better rate on this house. Thank goodness we got out ahead of this and we did get a deal on the rate. But, um, but it's interesting to hear you say that. And also just interesting to call out that, that idea that maybe the lowest rate isn't the right one. Yeah. And even you, and let's say, let's say that you, that you were unfortunate enough to have a high rate. The other thing that nobody tells you is this, the rate is not important. What's important is the volume of interest, the volume. I'll give you an example. You can buy a car at 1% and after five years, you can pay, let's say $5,000 worth of interest. So you go, well, you know, my rate was 1%. Okay. What if I sell, what if you can buy a car and let's say you classify at 6%, but then you end up paying $500 as a volume of interest and you go, what? What? You say, yeah, you can buy a car, 6%, and you can make it, you can control your payments in such a way that your volume of interest is a tenth of what it would have been if you got a rate that is two or three times lower. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about not the rate, the amount of money that you end up paying for the purchase. And that is called the volume of interest. So I always try to make my customers follow, uh, focus on the volume because that is the real cost, not the rate, is the volume of interest. I don't know if that makes sense. It, I think so. Let me try and, so you're saying like, say I buy a $10,000 car or you know, just random number, right? And, you know, it's a, it's a 6% loan, 7% loan, um, fairly high for a, financing a car. I know there's there's options out there that you can get zero, zero percent if you finance through the lender kind of thing but if you make principal only payments on it, it over a shorter amount of time and you're not going the full length of the loan uh your total amount of interest that you're going to be paying over the lifetime of the loan is isn't is negligible just because you financed it and paid it off early it, so what if it's a higher interest rate 
you were only doing it to get the positive credit report kind of thing. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes. And I'll tell you okay. why. Business people think in terms of cash flow. They don't think in terms of rate. Business people think, okay, I'm going to do this cash. I'm going to invest and I'm going to get so much Then I'm going to do this. So let's say you're a business person. Let's say your credit score is not that high. Usually business people don't tend to have a high credit score. And if we have the time, I can tell you why is that. So you go to a car company, there is the car that you want. You could buy cash again, but you don't want to do it because you have the cash for other things. Maybe you want to buy inventory. Maybe you want to do a business deal. So you don't want to use the cash. You go in and say, I want to buy this car. And because your credit is not that great, they quote you a 7% rate, which seems outrageous for a car. Because like you said, with a good credit score, you could get 2% or maybe nothing. And you said, okay, I'll pay the 7%. But because you work on cash flow, because you're a self-employed individual or a business person and you understand cash flow, now you pay that car in one year, which you could have done it anyhow. You're just using the credit to facilitate the purchase instead of having to wait the year. After a year, you add up all the volume of interest you paid, and probably you pay less interest than the guy that got a 3% for the same car from the same dealership because you manage your cash flow differently. Okay. So like to put this back in, in to house terms, for example, is the idea that basically we, you know, would finance at whatever rate we finance at, but maybe we just pay a little extra on our payments, right? You always hear about people, uh, you know, paying, you know, an extra 500 bucks or an extra hundred bucks or something on top of their loan just to try and chip away at that principle. So in that case, is that how we would reduce interest? Yes. Uh, because when you, a mortgage, it's really a financial instrument. Most people view the mortgage as a bill, but it's not a bill at all. It's a financial instrument. It's a financial instrument that builds equity for you and generates amazing tax, tax write-offs. If you look at it from that perspective, it changes completely the mindset. Instead of getting the bill and go, wow, $3,000 mortgage. Okay, here you are robbers, you know? You think, okay, it's $3,000 of which I'm getting $1,000 back right away because it's going into my pocket, you know? into my principal and the other 2000, I'm getting a write-off of 750. Okay. If you think that way, then you go, okay, how can I optimize the diminishes of my, how can I diminish my volume of interest? And I'll give you a quick example. Back when I started doing loans and in the, in the nineties, usually the proportion was one to three, meaning if you bought a hundred thousand dollar home, you will end up paying $300,000 in total. So your volume of interest was 200,000. That was 200% more than the price of the house. And that was normal. Today, in all the loans that we do, that percentage is about 98%. But for the sake of the discussion, I make it simpler. Let's say it was 100, okay? That means you buy a $100,000 home, and if you keep it all the way to 30 years, you're gonna end up paying 200,000. So you're paying 100% more of the value of the home. So the volume of interest now is $100,000. And that, by the way, is at a very good rate of four and a half or 5%. That's not considering a really high rate. Now, by paying some extra payments, and that can be mathematically and accurately calculated, and you can change it every month, you can decide, okay, of this 100,000, how much do I really want to pay? Do I want to pay 50? Do I want to pay 20? And you have total control over that. Total control over that. You don't have control over the rate, but you have control over the volume of interest that you will be paying. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And I, I imagine for a lot of people, it's a real challenge. You know, or I mean, I think there's a lot of people who tend to buy as much house as they can possibly get, right? So they're already sort of at the end of what they can afford. And so I think for maybe those people, you know, hearing this might be a good reason for buying something that's slightly less just to give you a little higher you know, amount of money or a little bit more money left over that you could then apply to that. So I yes. think that that's a, a really good idea, but also maybe great advice for you know backing off a little bit on what we borrow. Well, it's, it's also a principal only payment goes so much further than just your regular normal payment. Just an extra hundred bucks a month or 200 bucks a month um, after the amortization schedule uh, comes to fruition. I mean, just that extra principal only payment wouldn't be applied until the end of the loan normally until the interest has already been paid. Am, did, am I explaining that correctly? Like almost the, the, act, al okay. almost. The, 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 the amortization schedule is the minimum payment they expect from you. 
but that is not the payment that has to be done. If you if you are making a hundred or two hundred dollars more of principal, as long as you're current on your mortgage, that that amount of principal will be applied the next month to your to your balance. So you don't have to wait till the end of the loan. Every every uh, excess amount of principal that you make goes back to you the the next month. Now. There are a lot of theories, there are a lot of financial advisors, and you're going to read everywhere that you don't have to pay your home down for A, B, or C. But this is the reality that I see. The reality I see is that we don't save any money. It's very hard for people to save any money at all. When you have a house, you're forced to save because you're forced, even if you make the minimum payment, which is the payment that appears on the mortgage bill, you'll be surprised to know that that payment that you see there is just the minimum payment. But if you only do that, you automatically are saving about a third at the beginning, and then very soon it builds to half, and very soon it's more than half. To, from a third to half to more is coming back to you, and you are building equity, and there is no other, no other saving strategy that I have ever seen so far that compares to that. You say, well, but it's inefficient, you know, I'm not making a return on investment. If I put it in Wall Street, I would make so much. If I bought the stock, blah, blah. Yes, if, if you did all of those things, but 90% of people will never do any of those things because if you, have your, if you see yourself at the end of the month with a few extra dollars, it takes an enormous amount of willpower to once put it in savings, let alone do this on a consistent basis over the years. So saving on your house, I've never seen any other strategy. The only other strategy that I've seen is life insurance on a mutual company, but that's a different subject altogether. Yeah, we've actually had a few of those guests on in the past to discuss that. Um, can you maybe talk about um, lending options for investment purposes instead of your primary home that you live in? Yes. Are there, because that's kind of more what I'm interested in. At, at the moment, I'm looking at land deals. I'm looking at something that uh, maybe I could just, you know, put a yurt on or something like that. And it, nothing too expensive, just land only. But also, I'm also looking for passive income. Uh, as a self-employed person, if I were to buy like a home just for the rental opportunity or the passive income, are there different programs available that take that into consideration that, you know, your debt to income ratio is a little different based on the fact that the property is going to be generating income? Yes. What you mentioned at the beginning is called land banking, by the way, and that's a different subject, but that's a very good strategy. The only problem with land banking is that you don't get any income and you have to pay for taxes for the land yeah. until yeah. one day is going to be bought. But that's a very good strategy, by the way. But I'm going to answer your question. In the universe of investing, there are really three tiers, and the three tiers are very different. The first tier is what they call four to one, meaning a property that has four units or four dwellings to one dwelling. That has a cert certain set of rules. Then when the property has five doors or more, it has another set of rules. And that is divided in a, sm a, small, a small commercial, a small balance commercial, which are loans from 300,000 to 5 million, and then 5 million and up. I'm not going to address the 5 million and up, but just so you know, <clears throat> in the 5 million and up commercial, meaning the property has five units or more, the key factor is net worth. If you want to buy a $2 million building, the bank wants to see you have a $2 million net worth. And there is no if, buts about that. If you don't have the $2 million net worth and you want to buy the $2 million building, it's going to be an uphill battle. It can be done, but it's going to be an uphill battle. Now, once you go down from $5 million to three hundred, dollars and we're in the, still in the, in, the, in, the, in the commercial space, but now we are in the small balance commercial space, your net worth doesn't have to be the same as what you're buying. It could be less. But the property has to be producing money, has to be rented, and has to be producing income. Because if not, now you have to be able to show that you can afford to carry the property. And that is the problem for business people and entrepreneurs that are just starting in that area. Now, once we, con once we go now into the area of the four to one residential, it becomes a lot easier. So you don't have the rules of the commercial world anymore. In the commercial world, you have to put 25 or 30% down. There is no ifs and buts about that. Once you get into the four to one, 
And if you are an independent entrepreneur, this is what I would recommend. If you're going to buy a property for investment purposes, buy one that is already rented and has a lease agreement. Because if you can do that, you can use 75% of the income of the property to qualify. Oh, really? Yes. You, so if the, if the property is, is rented, I'm just going to put a number to make it simple. If the property is rented for $1,000 a month, there is a tenant that is paying, is not in default, and there is a lease agreement properly executed, not an internet lease agreement that somebody downloaded, but like if we are in California, hopefully a California Association of Realtors form, or if you are in another state, whatever is the official lease form, you know, because people tend to quote unquote, save money, they go to the internet, they download a, a lease agreement. Many of those lease agreements, even though legal, they are not a bank, um, they are not investment grade, you know? They have many legal loopholes that would not make a bank or a lender want to take a property that has that kind of agreement. So one thing is make sure that it's leased with a proper bankable investment grade lease then let's say the lease is a thousand the bank will credit you 750 you can use 750 so now it's 750 from your income monthly that you don't have to use so now you only need to do the down payment which is going to be about 20 to 25 percent and you need to for the other 20 percent um that the, the the bank is not giving you you have to supplement with your income but that makes it easier then you buy the property, leave it rented, put a business plan together. What are you going to do with the property? The business plan is going to take you a few months. You keep it rented. Once you decided on the business plan, then you let the tenant go, and then you execute your plan. If you want to buy a home for investment purposes that is vacant, then your income is going to have to support completely the home, and that is going to be harder because your debt-to-income ratio now is going to be very high. Yeah. And, and in fact, that leads me to sort of my next question I wanted to ask you against or ask you about. There's a lot of people who talk about, you know, buying investment properties, you know, for rental purposes or whatever. And I've heard people say that basically they borrow against their existing home or they're borrowing money against a, another property or whatever to cover the cost of the new one. Right. There's sort of this, I, I guess, strategy of rolling one into the next and so on so that you can sort of build up a big portfolio. I don't understand how that works at all. But like, I mean, if I'm interested in buying a, a rental home, for example, like if I wanted to be in this scenario, I have my, my primary uh, residence and then with my primary residence, can I then borrow against it to get other property? You could do so and you, and you will be able to do it. That is a little bit risky. If I were in your position, this is what I would do. I would try to get partners. Instead of having, let's say you need $100,000 to make the down payment, pay for the closing cost and have some, some budget for repairs. Instead of everything having to come from you, get with a couple of like-minded individuals and raise the money that way. If you still need to borrow against your home, do it, but not the full, the full brunt of it. A and is that really estate, just for like safety sake, like in the, in the case that your rental property never rents or something many, happens, you know, for, at least that way you're not on the hook for it? For many reasons, I'll tell you the overall reason. Every time you get a loan, you actually become a slave because every month or at a set, set date, you have to make a certain payment. That's why lenders make so much money because no matter what happens in your life, by a certain day, you have to make the payment, but life doesn't behave that way. If you have a property, the person may not pay, you know, because they got late or maybe you have to evict them or maybe, you know, the income stream is not going to be stable. The income stream is not going to be, even with the best tenant, you know, air conditioner goes out. He goes, you know, you need to fix it. For A, B, or C, what is going to happen is your loan is going to have to, you're going to have to make that loan no matter what. But on the other side of the transaction, that's the debit side. On the credit side of the transaction, you're not going to have the same kind of regular income. So that's why you don't want to do it that way, because you are entrapping yourself. You're putting yourself in a risky position. If you get a partner and everyone puts equity, equity doesn't generate a rate of return, like it has to be paid constantly at a certain point in time. Equity can wait. The tenant didn't pay. You have to evict it. You talk to your partners. Hey, you provide that on 